your mercy over me. No eye to see, no ear to hear, no heart to fully know how glorious, how beautiful you are. Beautiful one, I love. Beautiful one, I adore. Beautiful one. and I'm sponsoring a prayer quilt for my uncle Donald Cole. He's recovering from a stroke. He welcomes any support congregation members can provide him. Thank you for your prayers. Send prayers to Randy Fong at hotmail.com. Good morning, brothers and sisters. It is a joy to come together again, Sunday by Sunday, to the house of the Lord, the virtual house of God. My name is Ben Lim, and uh, it is a privilege for me to share the Word of God with you this morning. And as you know, and probably as have read in the CCC e-newsletter that I'm doing a series on the book of Nehemiah. And um, I have preached chapter one entitled, The Wall is Broken, What Can We Do? Right, in chapter one we saw Nehemiah. Um, a high-ranking official in the imperial court of the Middle Persian uh, Empire, King Arthur the Xerxes, and he served as a confidant of the king, as a cupbearer, to make sure that that any attempt to poison the king through his food or through drinks is thwarted. That's why he was called the Cabrera. But although he's in such a high-ranking position, this man has a heart for the people of God. 
And one day his brother came and visit him from Jerusalem, 800 miles away. And he inquired, hey, how are things in Jerusalem? No good, Hanani, the brother said. Even after waves and waves of exiles returned to Jerusalem for one reason or another, the wall is broken and is still not repaired. And that grieves Nehemiah a lot because he had such a high regard and zeal for the temple of God in Jerusalem. And so when he heard this story, what do you think Nehemiah do? I mean, for me, I would create a commission or form a committee for the rebuilding of the wall in Jerusalem because I'm so far away, 800 miles away from Jerusalem in the capital city of Susa. But that was not what uh, Nehemiah did. The first thing he did was he prayed. And his prayer became, becomes for me a pattern of how we ought to pray. And I used the acronym ACTS, ACTS. A means adoration, that all prayer must be focused upon who God is. Secondly, confession. We need to confess our sins not only towards him, but towards one another. Because if we hold anything against each other, especially in the light of what had happened at CCC, then God would not hear our prayer. It will be displeasing to God. So we need to confess our sins. When we confess our sins, the Bible says, His blood cleanses us not only from all sins, but from all unrighteousness. Thirdly, we need to have an attitude of thanksgiving, of gratitude, that in spite of whatever problems and issues that we have, personally, as a church or, or, or here in the United States of America, there are things that we can be thankful for. Gratitude is like the vaccine against all negativity and negative thoughts that we may have because they cannot coexist. And finally, he prayed. He prayed not only for himself, but he prayed for the Jews. And I'm sure he prayed for his boss, which King Arthur success. So I want to begin this, mo uh, this morning with words of prayer, and especially for my friend, Don Cole, whom I, we have just witnessed the, uh, the paracult um, for him. John and I used to exercise together with John uh, at uh, the Croc Center. And I can tell you this is a very fit man. He runs on a treadmill and there is no way I could keep up with, with him. But unfortunately, he had a stroke, as we just learned, and we want to commit him and others in the church to him at this time. So let us lift our hands to God. Our great and almighty God, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Lord, you have everything in your hands. You are sovereign in all your ways. And whatever we are going to say and, and the thoughts in our hearts, the prayer that we are going to make, they are not new to you. But this is just our humble request. And it will rise up, Lord, like incense to your holy throne. We want to commit our brother Don to you who had a stroke. We want to thank you for his recovery. And we ask, Lord, that you honor the desire of his heart 
to be strong, to go home, and even to drive. You love him, Lord, and we give you thanks. We give you praise that you have also delivered Warren from cancer. And we ask, Lord, that he too will be strengthened in his inner man. And that you, he will know that you never fail. I want to commit Angel to you, Nina's and Jeff's daughter, who is stricken by COVID-19. And I ask, Lord, for your special protection around him and the family. I pray that you will, your angels will be around, surrounding him, her, and the family. Be with them and others in their immediate vicinity. Pray for their protection. Lord, I want to pray for Manny's cousin, Herman, who have recently been promoted to glory in your presence. He had fought a good fight, and you have called him home. And I want to pray, Lord, for those surviving him, the family, and ask, Lord, that your presence will, will be with him. There are many others, Lord, who have needs, and we want to lay them down before the foot of the cross and ask your Lord that you in your own time will bring about wholeness, shalom to each and every one that you have brought to our minds and our hearts. We commit them all to you. We pray for the church. We pray for our nation and us, Lord, for your mercy. Give us an understanding of your word today as we continue our meditation on this man, Nehemiah, and his heart for you. We want to give you thanks for the instruction of your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I want to now share uh, my PowerPoint with you. And um, I hope you can see from where you are. So I'm going to preach from Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 to 8, on the series that the wall is broken down. And you wonder, what did Nehemiah do after he prayed, right? And, uh, and he was actually doing a lot of work. He was not just fasting and praying, but he was doing a lot of other stuff. He was preparing, all right? So, so let's um, move on. I wonder when you look at this uniform, uh, what comes to your mind? Well, this is the uniform of um, the Boy Scouts of America, BSA. The Boy Scouts was first uh, uh, formed by Baden Powell uh, in Britain. And uh, that was around 1908. And two years later, that movement spread, not just uh, to the United States, but around the world. So the Boy Scout uh, of America is actually a hundred years old, more than that. In fact, when Baden Powell was asked, hey, what, what is your vision? You know, what motto would you give? And he, he said, mm, be prepared. And people were wondering, huh, Baden Powell, maybe he's using his initial and said, be prepared. Prepared for what? His friends asked him, well, prepared for everything. Prepared for any eventualities. Prepared to serve. And indeed, they did serve uh, during the Second World War and throughout over this hundred years. And so, be prepared, all right? Uh, one of our founding fathers here in the United States, Benjamin Franklin, said, by failing to prepare, 
you are preparing to fail. And so it's important for us that we need to prepare and not just to pray. Now, so firstly, let me give you the context of Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 to 18. The context, 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 you know, those are the three criteria of reading the Bible, just like location, 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 uh, the three words for real estate. So in, when we look at context, we need to ask the journalist question, who are we talking about? I, so that must be Nehemiah. And in this passage, it was him having a conversation with the king. And behind that conversation is the God of heaven. Uh, many a times, you, we need to realize that God is behind. He may be invisible, but he is actively engaged in our discourse, our conversation, and our worship. He is here. And then we, we ask when? Well, it happened in the month of Nisan, which which really uh, is the month of March and April. And where did it happen? In the imperial court of King Arthur's Exus. And what were they talking about? Well, obviously they are talking about the city of Jerusalem, right? So that is the context of this passage. So let's look. In verses 1 and 2, in the month of the Nisan, in the 20th year of King Arthur Xerxes, when wine was brought for him, I, Nehemiah, took the wine, tasted it, and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the month of the Nisan, and you we learn from our last message that he discovered the situation of Jerusalem in the month of Kishlev, which is December. So between December, when he started praying and fasting, right until this moment, the month of Nisan, that's about four months. And so it's, it's very important, whatever may be the situation, that we base it with prayer. Whatever we may be going through, that we fast and pray. Now, I want to let you know that there is presently a global fast, 2020, because of what's happening in and around the world. Uh, there are at least 100,000 people fasting and praying. And I decided that I want to join this fasting and prayer for 40 days and 40 nights, all right? If you're interested, uh, this is a, a, a global movement. Uh, you can go and uh, Google the Jesus fast. So I want to continue fasting for this country until after the election. Now, Nehemiah pray, and, and he really didn't know what the next step is. Because there are two words for time. How long should you pray? Well, one word is chronos. The other word is kairos. The chronos is after I pray, I expect God to answer my prayers. You know, this is what we call the instant noodles, instant coffee mentality. But that's not the way God operates. God operates on a Kairos timeline. In other words, whenever we pray, it is important that we wait upon the Lord for his opportune time. Whether it's time for healing, whether it's time for resolution of a problem, or whether it's time uh, to get a job, or whether it's time to get married, you cannot force the situation. You cannot force God's hand. We got to wait for his opportune time. And this requires us to, to listen to God. And I call it triple listening because you need not only listen to God, you got to read God's word with your prayer request in mind. And you got to 
Watch out for circumstances. When is God going to act? And then you got to listen to yourself. You trust yourself because the Holy Spirit is in you. You got to know and have the wisdom in terms of knowing is this God's Kairos moment. So the king asked me, verse two, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? You're not sick. You don't have COVID. There is nothing but sadness of heart. Yes, this is what we call an emotional contagion, right? I'm sure Nehemiah tried his best not to do that, not to appear sad before the king. You see, this is like uh, COVID-19. It's sometimes you think it's asymptomatic, but it's there. And, um, and the king can sense it, right? Sadness of heart. So know that our emotions is contagious. I used to tell Sol Leong that, you know, when you're happy, I'm happy. When you're sad, I'm sad. And that is the nature of it. When you're angry, others are angry. Now you look at what is happening on the streets of many cities in the United States, that anger is contagious, that looting is contagious. And in this case, the king felt nothing but sadness of heart in Nehemiah. And the next thing we, we read here is that I was very much afraid. And you wonder why is Nehemiah afraid? Here's a king who, for all intent and purposes, sounded very empathetic, very caring, very concerned, which I'm sure he is. But what Nehemiah was afraid of is that he has violated the palace etiquette. There is certain uh, etiquette, the way you ought to carry yourself and behave in the presence of the king. Proverbs 16 verse 4 gives us a clue that a king's wrath is a messenger of death. He was afraid because this is not what he's supposed to do. Now, I come from a country that has the world's most number of monarch. We call them sultans. There are at least nine sultans. And out of the nine, they choose a king of kings called the Yang Di Patuan Agong. And I remember as a young graduate uh, serving as a Pagawai Britannia, means agricultural officer. And there are times when I have to come before the king. And there are certain palace etiquette, the way you dress, the tie you wear, the, the color of it, uh, the way you, you, you present yourself. You're not supposed to smile, neither are you supposed to be unhappy. And if I were to retreat from him after an audience, I cannot walk backwards and have my back facing him. So uh, there are palace etiquettes, and you don't violate them. No wonder Nehemiah was very afraid. So the second thing that we notice uh, in verses three and four is that he had been praying for an opportunity. He's, he has been waiting to, waiting on God for all these four months, and and really he didn't know how many more months he had to wait to get an audience with the king to to share about what's in his heart. And he said to the king, "May the king live forever." Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Now, amazing. God has raised Nehemiah for this opportunity to save 
the people of Jerusalem. Another story was the story of Queen Esther, who is who was many years, maybe a hundred years before um, Nehemiah. Esther, a Jewish girl, married also a Persian king, but the king is King Ahasuerus. And the uh, second in command, Haman, wanted to destroy and exterminate the Jews. And so the things that we hear coming from Persia, Iran in this case, today, that their one intent is to destroy and annihilate the Jews. That's nothing new. It happened in those days. And, and when Esther heard that, like Nehemiah, he was very, she was very sad. And there is no way he could violate the palace etiquette because you cannot come into the presence of the king unless the king calls you. Even though she is the queen, that's how solemn the palace etiquette is. And then this statement, who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this, was said by Mordecai, who, who raised Esther. Because Esther was scared. She was afraid. Like Nehemiah. In the English standard version, it says, who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Who knows? We are all part of the kingdom of God. Who knows that God has a purpose for your life? Whoever you are, whatever situation, wherever you are, you need to know, I need to know that God has a purpose for our lives. When God called me into full-time ministry, God gave me Luke chapter 1 verses 74 and 70, 75. And it says that we being delivered from the hands of our enemies should serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness all the days of our life. And all the days of our life is that what you say, Lord, that there is no retirement. Yeah, no retirement. We are to serve God. If you are retired, you have a, a smaller, maybe a smaller uh, area of influence. In that smaller area, whether it's just your home or your close needed family or friends, that's where you exert your godly influence. For some of us, we may have an office. Others, we have an audience that's much bigger, but whatever it is, exercise your godly influence like Esther and Nehemiah. And that moment, the king said to me, what is it you want? Wow, I mean, this is, this is it, this is it, you know? And are you going to say it? Now, look, there's this two guy, and there's one, that little guy on the, on, the left say, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Tell the king what you want. You have been waiting all this time. And this other guy says, shut up. Shut up. Now, there are sometimes when the Lord wants you to say certain things, even at the risk of your own life, I wonder what your decision will be. What would you do? Would you shut up? Or would you speak up? If you speak up, you might be accused of treason because you're trying to build a rebellious uh, people. Now, these, the Jews have always rebelled against uh, the, uh, the imperial masters, whether it's the Egyptians, the Syrians, Persians, and later the Romans and the Greeks. You'll be the end of him. Is this really it? So it's not an easy matter, not an uh, easy decision. 
Now let's see what、uh, Nehemiah did. He prayed to the God of Heaven. He did what what we call a popcorn prayer, a spontaneous prayer to God. So he is a man of prayer. Who even when God opens the door of opportunity, the Kairos moment, he still want to pray to God and ask God for help. Now, this is what Nehemiah does. He's a man of prayer, of popcorn prayers. All right, I try to list down every occasion that I can find of him doing this spontaneous popcorn prayers. Now, I want to ask you a question. Right? How many times do you think he did this、uh, popcorn prayers in the book of Nehemiah, the thirteen chapters? Just make a wild guess. You can put it in the in your chat.、Um, well, the answer is ten times. I'm sure he did it many, many, much, much more. All right, but there are ten times here, and、um, all different occasions. He just shot a prayer to to the Lord, whatever the occasions may be, whether it's friendly or unfriendly、uh, situations. Or you, you have a quick count. You might think, oh, that's only nine, but there's one more there where I pray now. Strengthen my hands, O Lord, because he was facing opposition. To the project that he was trying to do. Now, if you take a closer look at these prayers, I want you to notice how many times he prayed, "Oh my God, OMG!" And he was serious about it. But you hear this OMG so very often, and you wonder why do people exclaim? OMG, or write in their chat or in their social media, and you think it is a correct use, or it is used the way Nehemiah did. To me, it seems more like an exclamation mark. It sounds like a punctuation mark. It sounds like a frivolous use of God's name. Now, I'd like you to think about it: whether that is、uh, pleasing. Uh, to God, or is that taking God's name in vain, or whatever it is? We know that Nehemiah prayed, right? He prayed to the God of Heaven. He is a man who not only spent expand, extended time in prayer and fasting, but who who learned to pray to God unceasingly. And so, do you think he should speak up after praying? Or he should shut up. Well, we learned that he 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 spoke, but he was wise in the way he spoke. So not only did he use God's opportune time, but he used his God's sanctified common sense because he said that he used he he used what is called the breach. All right,、uh, something in common between the Persian and the.、Uh, Jews, that both cultures are interested in in the burial rites of their ancestors. So he starts off with that, but that he did not refrain from saying what is difficult. That is, the gates have been destroyed by fire. We all hear about the Black Lives Matter movement, and I'm not trying to be political. Uh, you decide how you view this, but definitely there is racial tension in the country that is based on historical facts, and because of this, you know,、uh, we need to learn how to build bridges like、um, Nehemiah did. There's this enmity now. This this. Talk about white privilege in the universities and all over that have somehow spilled over from the streets into violence. How do we build bridge? How do we have conversation so that we deal with the racism that 
exist not only in this country, but all over the world, with their people, there will be racial prejudice and racism. Now, Soren and I like to watch a movie every week, and sometimes it's my turn, sometimes it's her turn, and last week it was her turn. And she chose this movie called The Same Kind of Different as Me. It's an amazing story. We didn't even know that it is really a Christ, Christ, true Christian story uh, from Texas. That has turned the, 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 the author, Ron, has not only written a book with that title, but also a movie had been produced, the same kind of different as me. I'm, I, I want to tell you a little bit about how they build the bridges. They are wealthy. This white family is very wealthy, uh, successful family. But God put in the heart of Debbie, the, the wife, uh, and, and she invited the husband to build that bridge to the homeless, particularly the blacks. Uh, and they, they have an um, inner city ministry where they serve meals. And God gave a, a dream to Debbie that you're going to meet this man. And one day this man came in and started turning tables over. He's a violent man, very dangerous man. But God put, God's love was in their hearts. God put a desire in their hearts to befriend this man. And that breach, the, their willingness to cross over and to hear from this black man, the atrocities that he had experienced uh, from the KKK was what turned them around. And the long and short of the story is that in the end, this man became a blessing uh, to this white family in terms of strengthening the husband-wife relationship and strengthening the relationship between the man and the father, who is a real racist guy. So it is important to use your privilege, whether it's white privilege or minority privilege. All of us have privileges. I have a PhD, that's my privilege. I'm male, that I have a masculine privilege. It is important to use our privilege, whatever your privilege may be, or social status, for godly influence, for good. That we use it not to dominate, not to oppress, but to serve others. That God's name may be glorified, and that God's people and his people, Christian or non-Christians, be edified and that God's kingdom be advanced. The third thing is that we need to do our homework. Not only should we just pray, but do our homework. And definitely, you can see that uh, Nehemiah did his homework. In that four months, he wasn't just praying, and that's it, period. And I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant have found favor in your sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, well, how long will your journey take? And when will you come back? I wonder, I mean, if you ask questions like that, would you scratch your head? Oh, I, I, I'm sorry, I never, never thought about it. Like, let me spend some time to think about it. No, that was not uh, uh, Nehemiah's response, right? When the king asked, it pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. He has already drawn out the whole schedule of this project. So firstly, he asked for a leave of absence, and he set a time. What an amazing man. Uh, he was able to, because of the way he planned in detail, uh, in terms of the floor plan, he was able to complete the project in 52 days compared to the decades that the other returnees couldn't do. And then after the dedication of the walls within the year, and then he was appointed as a governor. And that is 12 years. That's a long time. If you look at Nehemiah 5, 14 and 13, 6, 
it's 12 long years. And then I also said to the king, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans Euphrates so that they will provide me a safe conduct, a safe journey until I arrive. That I may have a letter to Asaf, the keeper of the king's forest, so that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, by the temple, for the city wall, and for the residence I will occupy. Are you prepared? This man was totally prepared. He is like, he's not just a cup bearer. He, he seems to be an engineer. He seems to be an architect. Uh, he, he seems to be a strategist. He asked for protection, a safe journey. He asked for provisions from the uh, king's forest. What a man. What a man. So the two requests are requests that we ourselves ask for protection and provision. So that journey of 800 miles, he needs protection because they are hostile people, especially against the Jews. They are bandits, they are bad people. He prayed and the king allowed a battalion of soldiers to go uh, with him to protect him so that he have a safe trip. But uh, that's from Susa to uh, Jerusalem, 800 miles. And he couldn't bring all the stuff along uh, from Susa because it's too far. So he asked for provision when he uh, arrives in Jerusalem. And provisions for, for three projects, three building projects. The uh, gates of the citadel of the temple and then the walls of Jerusalem and his own home. So God cares for us in terms of our needs and the needs of the church and the needs of other people as well. So let me conclude. 8b says, And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my request. There's such a partnership between God and others and Nehemiah. So it is very important that we not only be heavenly minded, that we be earthly minded as well. Uh, Oliver Holmes said, some people are so heavenly minded that they are of no earthly good. And I'm sure that we don't want to be like that. All right, so heavenly minded that they are no earthly good. There are people like that who will just say, just trust the Lord, trust the Lord. And I remember as pastors, you know, the church members will always be telling us, don't worry, you trust the Lord. God will give you a heavenly dwelling. Don't worry about your future. Just trust the Lord. You know, God will provide you a car. Well, God indeed did. But it is not helpful when people uh, have such heavenly mindedness that they don't care about others, especially his servants ministering here on earth. So don't be so heavenly minded that you are no earthly good. Be prepared. So the question, brothers and sisters, is are you prepared? Or are you so earthly minded that you are of no heavenly good, that you're not ready for heaven if the Lord were to call you home like he called a Herman. Are you prepared? Have you received the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior, even though you were raised in a Christian home, even though you attend this church for ages? Have you? Are you prepared? Are you prepared for whatever eventualities. As Christians, we are not immune from COVID. No, we are all fallen people. We will suffer the same consequences of sin that others suffer. Are we prepared? Are we prepared as a church to come together 
when COVID is over. Are we prepared for a possible second wave of COVID? Now, probably the most contentious election is just around the corner. And people are saying, if you are reading the news and social media, that it's not going to look pretty. And that whoever wins, whether Joe Biden or Donald Trump, there is going to be violence. And I'm not trying to uh, uh, be a pessimist, but the way things are, whether violence or non-violence, are you prepared? Are you preparing food and provisions for your family? Not that you, you, you should hoard. It's not about hoarding. It's about making sure that you have sufficient supplies when things happen that's really beyond your control. It is said that the Mormons prepare for any kind of eventualities for a year. And I think we have much to learn from our Mormon uh, brothers and sisters. So are you prepared, brothers and sisters? Uncle Sam is asking you, are you prepared? Are you prepared to vote? Are you prepared for whatever comes? So let us remember uh, verse 18 says, I told him of the hand of God that has been upon me for good. And that was when he arrived at Jerusalem. And also the words that the king had spoken to me. So the decisive fact that brothers and sisters is not Nehemiah's faith, but the object of his faith. And that is the hand of God. The hand of God. The hand of God is upon you, brothers and sisters. And when the hand of God touches you, this is what happens there will be a spark and you can sense his presence in your life. Let us pray. Father, this moment we want to come before you with outstretched hands, touching your hands. And we know and sense your presence here in our midst. We know hard times are ahead, that when we look at the signs of what is happening in the world, we know that we are in the last days when you are coming back. Are we prepared? May we not be like the foolish virgins who are not prepared for your second coming or not prepared for whatever may happen around us, especially with the coming election. So Lord, we want to commit ourselves to you, that we may be prepared as a church to come together, to pray, to surrender our nations to you. We pray, Lord, that we will not be like the Boy Scouts, who are not prepared for the changing norms of, of society. The Boy Scout had that motto, be prepared. But this year, they had to declare bankruptcy because they were not prepared. They were not prepared for the changing sexual immorality that has infected them, where there are so many legal suits against them because of sexual abuse of young boys. And I want to pray, Lord, that we as a church may not be like the Boy Scouts, that we will be prepared for your coming sooner or later. We pray for our nation, we pray for peace, we pray for healing, and we pray against COVID-19. We want to pray against the social unrest, but we want to pray, Lord, that we'll build bridges with one another, between the blacks and the whites and the people of color. We want to pray, Lord, that there will be harmony. We want to pray that there will be peace. We ask and pray all these things in the name of our God, the King of heaven and the Lord of lords and the King of kings. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters. And may the blessing of the Lord be with you. May you be prepared in your body, in your spirit, in your soul, for whatever may come, and be ready for his second coming. Amen. God bless. stars they wept the morning sun was dead the savior of the world was falling his body on the cross his blood poured out for us the way Sing a